Hey guys, Nintendrew here. Let's talk video game ports. Of course, ports have been around for an eternity. The original Doom is a great example. That title seems to have been brought over to every platform under the sun. But every once in a while, I'll come across a surprising port that I had never heard of, and when that happens, I have to pick it up just to see how the devs handled a new piece of hardware. And that's what this video is all about. Today, I'll be covering five surprising game ports you might not have known about. Let's check it out. First up is Grand Theft Auto for the Game Boy Color. This version of Grand Theft Auto was released in 1999 and developed by Tarantula Studios, making it the only version of the original GTA that was handled by an outside studio. And for what it's worth, this port is pretty impressive. Unlike countless other handheld ports of the era, this one was converted tile for tile from its PC counterpart, which was a real technical achievement at the time, and gave this game a much larger overworld than many other titles on the platform. Of course, this release did suffer in other areas, such as graphical and audio fidelity when compared to the original, and it received generally lukewarm critical reception as a result of the downgrade. One interesting tidbit here is that the Game Boy Color port was heavily censored at Nintendo's request to appeal to a younger and wider audience, with both gore and swearing removed entirely. As a result, this title also marks one of the very few instances of a GTA game rated T for Teen by the ESRB. If you're a fan of the series and are curious about its early history, this title may be worth picking up. Next is Myst for Nintendo DS. If you're not familiar with the original, Myst is a classic point-and-click puzzle adventure game for Mac and PC released all the way back in 1993. At the time of its launch, the game was praised for its immersion and story and held its own as the best-selling PC game for almost a decade until The Sims dethroned it in 2002. However, the DS version was fairly universally slammed for having poor visuals, audio, and controls, and for repackaging a 20-year-old game with a full $30 price tag. To be honest, this version is practically unplayable for anyone who is not intimately familiar with the original and would know exactly where to go and what to do. The reduced resolution of the DS screens, as well as poor compression throughout, cause interactive objects to kind of fade into the backdrops. So in practice, if you want to beat this game, you've got to run around tapping everything in sight, hoping to find something that moves. Some years later, the game went on to see an equally poor conversion for the 3DS, and one would be forgiven for thinking that the publisher seems to be trying to cash in on a title whose heyday passed over two decades ago. Next up is Half-Life for the Sega Dreamcast. Although this version of Half-Life was never officially released, the game was in its final stages of production and was just a few short weeks away from launch when Valve pulled the plug. In 2003, just two years after the game's intended launch, a development build of the game was leaked to the public and spread like fire across the Dreamcast community. This leaked ROM appears to be, for all intents and purposes, the final production-ready version of the game. Of course, the Dreamcast is notorious for its non-existent piracy protection, and today it's very easy to write the leaked build to a standard CD-ROM and experience the port in its entirety. Interestingly, Half-Life's second original expansion, titled Half-Life Blue Shift, was originally developed exclusively for this version of the game, but after its cancellation, it was ported back to the PC for a later release. In addition to this expansion, the game also features improved models and visual effects. Truly, it's unfortunate that this port never saw an official release. The devs clearly put in a lot of work, even down to the Lambda logo proudly displayed on the Dreamcast's VMU. However, this version does suffer from one pretty major setback in the form of frequent and lengthy loading screens, a complaint which was made by a number of early reviewers and may have influenced the decision of cancellation. After that, we've got Donkey Kong for the Atari 2600. If you watched my video on 5 Mario games for non-Nintendo platforms, you probably remember that Mario Brothers saw a release for the Atari 2600 in 1983. Well, Donkey Kong also made that platform jump just one year earlier. After the runaway success of Donkey Kong in arcades, Coleco initially approached Nintendo and secured the rights to distribute the title for consoles. In 1982, Coleco launched their ColecoVision system bundled with the game as a console exclusive, but six months later they decided to branch out and license the title for the Intellivision and the Atari 2600. For someone familiar with Donkey Kong's history, this port may not be news at all. 
But for others who are used to Nintendo's post-NES success, it can be pretty surprising to see a classic Nintendo game ported for an eventual competitor system. But in many ways, Donkey Kong is similar to Doom in that it saw a staggering number of conversions for other platforms following its launch, and by my count we're up to almost 20 different unique releases for PCs and home consoles. And finally, the last game on today's list is Call of Duty for the Nokia Engage. And what an interesting title to wrap up the list. The Engage was a combination cell phone and handheld video game system from Nokia, which was launched in October 2003, and was expected to compete with Nintendo's Game Boy Advance by leveraging the boom in popularity of mobile phones. In 2004, developer Infinity Ward decided they would get on the hype train with this port of the original Call of Duty. Despite being marketed as a direct port, this version was built on a unique engine with a new set of levels and scaled back mechanics, which helped in bringing the console game to mobile. Of course, in the end, the Engage was a commercial failure, in small part due to some pretty shoddy titles like this one. The game suffers from wildly erratic frame rates and frequent bugs, but it does showcase some interesting features such as 4-player local multiplayer over Bluetooth. At the end of the day, there's not much reason to go back and experience this version today, but much like the first title we covered, this one can be viewed as a technical achievement for its time. Okay guys, that's the end of our list for today. I hope you've enjoyed this look at some interesting video game ports. Of course, if you did, please do consider subscribing to Nintendrew for all sorts of cool gaming content, and make sure to share the video with any friends who might find it interesting. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye! Hey guys, thanks again for checking out the video and for making it all the way to the end. Hope you enjoyed. As always, I've got links to all my social media in the description below. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, that sort of thing. And if you'd like to help out even more, I've got a link to my Patreon on the right side of your screen. Otherwise, I hope you'll look out for the next video. Take care.